So excited to be talking to Professor Richard Wolf. He's the host of Economic Update. He's a professor of economics emeritus at UMass Amherst. He's a visiting professor at the New School, and he's the founder of Democracy at Work. He's the author of several books, including The Sickness is the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. Welcome, Professor Wolf. Thank you, Katie. Glad to be here. Yes, welcome back. I wanted to ask you about so many different things, ranging from um, the uh, United States economy, uh, capitalism, empire, Russia, Ukraine. But I know that you have family in France, and I was just wondering if you had anything you wanted to share about what is happening now with the French elections. Yes, I think there are really uh, many things. Uh, My family is French. My father was born in France and so on. I've kept touch with it. Uh, But two things I think might particularly interest an American audience. First, and I know this is not a surprise, the, the major media in the United States, the way they cover, or to be more honest, don't cover uh, what goes on in places like France, is so off the mark, so lopsided, so incompetent and inadequate that it's almost embarrassing to sort of lay it out. But let me very briefly uh, do that. If you read the mainstream media, you would be told that there was a vague collection of candidates. Not much is told about them. There were quite a few, by the way. Uh, But that only really two matter. The sitting president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and a challenger from the pretty far right wing, Marina Le Pen, uh, who's the daughter of uh, another Le Pen member uh, who started that party, uh, a Holocaust denier, a, a very strong anti-Semitic, very, very strong anti-immigrant, just awful, uh, way over on the political one. And you would hear that this was what happened. Um, that's really not true. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, among the people who voted, 72% of the people of France who voted, voted for someone other than Emmanuel Macron, the sitting president. 72%. And if you add those who didn't bother to vote, because they could certainly couldn't care, you're talking about a, a president who, after a long first term, is unable to generate anything other than as I say, about 28% of the people who voted bothered to vote for him. Coming in second was Marina Le Pen, right winger, with 23.1% of the vote. So roughly one out of five French people voted the far right. What is not reported almost anywhere in the United States is the information about who came in third. Third is the the candidate's name is Mélenchon. You never even hear it. He is a anti-capitalist, long-time socialist, Marxist candidate. What did he get? 22%. That is literally 1.1% less than Marina Le Pen, who gets overwhelming coverage in every newspaper. He gets absolutely none. Further, just a little playing with the numbers. The Communist Party of France, which puts up its own candidate who ran in this election, got roughly two and a half percent of the French vote. If you put together the far left Mélenchon and the candidate of the Communist Party, together they outwrote Marina Le Pen. The image of France, therefore, and its politics may uh, be comforting to the right of center in the United States, but it's a grotesque misrepresentation of where the French people are at. Number two, second point to get. Um, For a long time after World War II, there really were two political parties that dominated the landscape of French electoral politics. One was right of center. It had a variety of names, but people remember uh, Pompidou and uh, uh, a long list of right of center traditional 
uh, uh, politicians. Uh, and then there was the left of center, which in France was represented by the Socialist Party. And they would exchange, one would win and the other lose and vice versa, kind of roughly like the Republicans and Democrats here in the United States. What happened in France, and it's been going on for a while, but culminating in the election was that those two parties together, I remember, I don't remember the numbers, but together got less than 10% of the vote. In other words, as political parties go, they're gone from being the major parties whose leaders were prime ministers of France or presidents of France. They went into a spiral which can only be described by the collapse of the middle of French politics. So you're now on the extreme, Mr. Macron, who basically tried to appeal to the right and failed, challenged by Marine Le Pen, who makes a bigger appeal to the right uh, and threatens him. And then on the other hand, a collection of communist, socialist, Green Party, and then this unified left represented by Mr. Mélenchon um, picking up a strong presence in France, you know, one out of uh, five, more than one out of five French people voted either for Mélenchon or the Communist Party. I could add the Socialists and the Greens, and it would be closer to a third of the people voted that way, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's a testimony to the collapse of the middle in Western uh, politics, and it is a testimony to a level of inadequacy of mainstream media that really is stunning in the sharpness of it. One final point. One of the issues that is generally agreed by all points of view to have played virtually no role in the French election were the events in Ukraine. It should be thought about what that means. It's just not an issue. Could not be effectively used by anyone. Mr. Macron tried very hard to play the role of diplomat, talking to Mr. Putin and talking to Biden. Uh, Marina Le Pen is associated with Putin because she has made a point of doing that. And clearly, that the two different, slightly different positions around Mr. Putin played no significant role. It's not an important issue for most French people. And why do you think the United States media is doing such a terrible job at discussing these issues? Well, I think it's a long uh, tradition. It, it, it's a need to insulate the United States, to isolate the United States, to make the American people not ask the question, gee, if countries that we thought were kind of like us, or at least allies or friends or something like that, why are they embracing socialism, communism? We, we have a long history. Let me give you the, another example just to drive the point home. Back in 2016, there was a general election in the country of Portugal. Everybody in America knows about Portugal. There's a sizable Portuguese immigrant community that came to the United States at various points. And it's a tourists go there. I mean, it's a well-known part of European uh, countryside. Uh, European politics. So there was a general election. And uh, like most European countries, which Americans don't know, they don't just have two parties. They have a much larger number of parties. They also have proportional representation. So if 20% of the people vote for party X, 20% of the seats in parliament are held by party X. The idea being, if 20% of the people support a political perspective, then that perspective should be part of the laws being written and the debates and so forth as a reflection of a commitment to democracy. Uh, this itself, Americans don't get. Uh, not, it doesn't get discussed. It doesn't get pointed out. But the example of Portugal takes us further. Who won the election? No one party came out in top, typical. And so a coalition government had to be established. Three parties became the government of Portugal back in 2016, which is now six years ago. 
The leading one was the Portuguese Socialist Party. The number two in the coalition governing is the Portuguese Communist Party, and the number three is the Portuguese Green Party. In 2020, they went, they stood for election again, and they were voted in, they won again, and they are the government now. You could count on the fingers of one hand the number of Americans who are even aware of what I just said, because it is simply, and by the way, it's not the only one. How many people understand that Angela Merkel, the leader of Germany, most of the time had to govern Germany as part of a coalition with another party that is the German Socialist Party, et cetera, et cetera. It, there is a need not to understand the way socialism became and has been for decades an intrinsic part of the consciousness and the politics of most countries in Europe. Uh, Americans need to be kept away from wondering how that might be, why that might be, what that means. And what it means that we don't have anything comparable to it here in the United States. Before we get into Russia and Ukraine, uh, what was your family's trajectory to and from France? Well, my father was born there. My, he was born in the city of Metz, M-E-T-Z, which is right on the border between France and Germany, and which over the many centuries of war between France and Germany sometimes was French, sometimes was German. And so he had to grow up bilingual, which is typical in that area. You have to speak French and German. 